Hello. <laughs> um, right, before I start, hands up those who have heard of Michael Hollingshead. So a fair smattering of you. OK, basically I'm going to tell you the story of this guy's life. And whether you know about him or not, by the end of this talk, you'll know a lot more than you ever thought possible. The reason I wrote it was because when I was writing Albion Dreaming in 2006, 2007, his name kept cropping up over and over again. And I'd heard the name before, and I just thought, oh, yeah, he's the guy who turned uh, Leary onto LSD. But I suddenly began to realise there's a lot more to him than that, both before his time with Leary and right up to his death in 1984. And when I started digging into it, I realised that this wasn't just another, uh, what I call a glossy psychedelic narrative written by one of the movers and shakers who, 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 who um, you know, had their life to promote and uh, goods to sell and things like that. Uh, this was a story of, um, it's like the underbelly of the psychedelic movement, in that you've got this guy who was a massive mover and shaker, both in Britain and America, yet underneath it all, it was a deeply troubled and disturbed pe person. And to me, that's much more of a real-life story than all this, you know, love piece surfing in the sun when you're tripping sort of nonsense, which was, you know, just like the glossy TV version of it. Um, so, <clears throat> he's possibly one of the most enigmatic characters in the whole history of... Uh, of uh, psychedelics. As you can see there from the, uh, the cover of my book and the, the slides, it comes in many different guises from, you know, looking like um, somebody from the British consular on his, um, on his passport photograph to the wild-eyed hippie in Nepal at the top uh, to the sort of slightly bloated mid-80s uh, cocaine addict. So there are many um, Michael Hollingsheads. It was many things. Um, and as we go through here, we'll find out, was he a fool? Well, yes, he was a fool, as you'll see. Was he an acid guru? He certainly was an acid guru. He really wanted to be Timothy Leary. That was his, his real aim in life, but he never got there. Um, was he a trickster? God, yes. He tricked people out of their minds, their bodies, their money, uh, anything he could trick people out of. Um, was he a black magician? Well, um, Amanda Fielding, uh, who knew him well in the mid-60s, was, was of the opinion he was a black magician in one sense or another. Was he a emotionally, psychologically and emotionally disturbed? Absolutely. Was he a junkie and an alcoholic all his life from the age of about 15? Was he a charlatan? Well, yes and no, he, he was who he was, but he certainly pretended to be a lot of things that he wasn't, which I think is the definition of a charlatan. Um, was he a secret agent? Uh, lots of people have suggested that he was, and there's no doubt about it that he was a police informer at times. Whether he was a state asset or not remains to be seen. I couldn't prove that. Was he a genius? Um, yes, he was a genius. He, his IQ was at genius level, and everyone who met him, including Tim Leary and others, said he was one of the most intelligent men that they'd ever met. Was he deeply spiritual? If you read his autobiography, The Man Who Turned On The World, he thought he was deeply spiritual, but I don't think he was. Um, was he a catalyst for social change? Well, yes, because had he not turned Leary onto acid in the way he did, um, we probably wouldn't even be sat here today because the psychedelic revolution would have um, panned out completely differently. Was he the man without whom Leary would not have happened? Well, yes, because Leary would have come across acid eventually, but it's, it's the way he came across it through Hollingshead that set Leary on his particular trajectory uh, through life. Was he the man who turned on the world? He was, really. Was he a selfish sociopath? God, yes. Was he charismatic? Absolutely. He had the, the ability to, to draw people to him like a moth to a flame. He wasn't particularly physically attractive or anything, but he just had a way with people. And it was like Marmite. People absolutely loved him, or they wouldn't touch him with a barge pole. And I'll tell you some stories as we, uh, we progress. Was he a criminal? Well, yes, because he took drugs, so therefore he was a criminal. But he did much more than that, as we'll hopefully see. Was he a police informer? Yes, as I've said. Uh, oh, there you go. But we have to go right back to the beginning to sort of unravel his story. <clears throat> Michael Hollingshead wasn't even his real name. Um, his real name was Michael John Schinkfield, and he was born on the 30th of September 1931 in um, Darlington, and that's his, uh, his birth certificate there. He was born to a very ordinary family. His uh, father was a, a clerk in a coal mine, and they lived a very sort of northeast of, of England life. And that actually meant that his, um, his father was uh, an alcoholic, uh, a wife beater, and a thoroughly unpleasant man. And something happened to Hollingshead in his formative years, and, and this is the key, really, to his whole personality. Um, 
I came home from school one day to find his father uh, beating his mother up yet again, and he, he was 14, I think, by this time, so he intervened and tried to stop it. His mother turned on him, as people in domestic violence relationships often do turn on the children if they try to intervene, and at that point he just said to his daughter later on in life, he said, I threw away the key, I wanted nothing more to do with them. Within a couple of months of that happening, he did something and we don't know what it is because there are no records of it, but whatever he did was so bad that he was shipped away from Darlington to a school outside London called the Red Hill School, um, which was run on um, psychoanalytical terms and had a lot of contact with uh, Freud's daughter. <coughs> so this was a school that had something like 41 places uh, a year available, and they had two or 3,000 referrals from all over the country, and yet Hollingshead got there. So he did something to someone that was very bad indeed. I have no idea what that was because there are no records. The school records are closed for 100 years. I personally think it was something of a sexual nature, but we don't know. Um, that's the Red Hill School on the right, and that's a class photograph. And you can see Mr. Shinkfield, before he was Hollingshead, on the top left with a striped blazer. Um, and you can see that he's got his arm around a small child in front, which is sort of a bit emblematic of his whole modus operandi. After he left uh, Red Hill School in 1950-51, uh, those were the days when people had to do a national service, and he was shipped off to um, a camp on the Wirral, and that's him there in his uniform. Again, his national service records seem to be completely not existent, so we don't know what he did there. But when he came out of um, national service, he, he went to um, Sweden and Norway, and he was able to speak Swedish Norwegian fluently, so the chances are he did some language training uh, when, he went, um, when he was in national service. So he did two years in national service. He came out, went to Sweden and Norway, and then he was to and fro in between Sweden and Norway, and he was writing articles for The Times. He had a series on um, Swedish uh, radio dealing with... Um, teaching people how to teach English and also um, telling them about the, the joys of being a tourist in London. And he was to and fro and back and to from London all this time. And it was sometime in the late 50s that he met several people who would become uh, very crucial to the rest of his uh, life. And these were the people on screen there. The guy on the left, anyone know who he is? Rubbish, you don't know your history, do you? That's Dr. John Beresford, who, who will, you'll see more about in a moment. And then you've got the guy at the top with the, uh, the cigarette is a guy called Desmond O'Brien, who was a disgraced old Etonian who, um, who had lots of money and uh, wanted to do bad things with it. The guy at the bottom is, um, yep, yeah, Alex Trockey, who, who we met in London. And that's uh, Brian Barrett there, a key figure in the British psychedelic um, revolution of, of the 60s and 70s, and wrote a fantastic book called The Road of Excess. He met all these people in, in late 1950s London, very, very early 60s, um, and um, they, they shared a liking for um, heroin, based, heroin and alcohol, and it was, they, they, they were all addicted to heroin and alcohol around that time. And certainly with O'Brien and Trocky, one of their favourite things was to go out of a Saturday night into the... Um, the clubs of Mayfair and what have you, and basically seduce young de debutants and, and, and literally screw them for whatever money they could get out of them. It was a very um, unpleasant um, way of living. Um, after a while, he ran out of, um, ran out of favours in, um, in, in London. <coughs> his, his Swedish marriage failed, so he went to, um, he went to America. He went to America in uh, late 1959, and... Um, Oops. Oops. There we go. That's him in America in, in early 1960. And he, he married an American woman called Sophie Nyman, which, which is there. Now, that picture was taken about six months after their marriage. And I think you can see from the body language that all was not groovy. Um, that's inside in a deck chair there. Now, when he went to America, he met up again with Dr. John Beresford, who had by now moved from Britain to New York and was the head of a pedi pediatric hospital in New York. Beresford and Hollingshead had, had a big interest in drugs. Um, you know, they smoked dope, they took speed, and so on and so forth. Uh, and one day, um, Hollingshead suddenly read about LSD and, and said, said to Beresford, we've got to try this, how do we get it? So... Hollingshead, allegedly, and there's no actual proof for this, even though all the stories tell, tell us this, 
um, rang Aldous Huxley up and said, how do, how's the best way for me to, uh, to get Aldous on L LSD? So Huxley said, well, you, ju you just order it from Sandoz. So they ordered a gram between them from, from Sandoz in New York, and this gram came, and if you read the, the official psychedelic histories, this is known as the magic gram, and it was supposed to be the, the gram that turned everyone on at that time, and that Hollings had spooned it all into a mayonnaise jar, and he had 5,000... Um, 200 microgram doses in a mayonnaise jar, and that's sort of legendary. It's like one of the earth stories of, of um, psychedelic history. Now, <clears throat> the first thing I did when I was researching this book, I thought, there's no way you can get 5,000 doses of, um, of acid into a mayonnaise jar. So I tested it. You maybe get 200 doses. So that earth story is fucking nonsense from the start. Um, it's part of the mythology that, that um, the Holling Zed um, made up for himself. Um, but the point is, him and Beresford got absolutely wasted beyond belief. They were so high, they had no, how much to, no idea how much to take. And when they were splitting it all up, they were getting it on the fingers, and it was going through the skin, and they were licking their fingers and taking spoonfuls. Um, and if you read the account of, of, of his experience in, in, in my book, um, it's like basically he went to the you know, land of the gods, and it just blew his mind. And he realized that um, this was a powerful drug, and he needed to, to do something about it. So he rung Huxley up again and said, I've just taken some acid, it was amazing, and what do I do now? So Huxley allegedly said to him, there's a guy you need to see who's really doing some serious psilocybin work called Dr. Timothy Leary at Harvard. So um, Hollingshead thought, right, well, I'll, I'll do that, I'll go see Leary. But before we do that, just as a point uh, of another mystery in the whole story, if, as the psychedelic histories and Hollingshead himself says, they only had this magic gram and, it all, and he took it and he took it all to Leary, um, how do we account for this, which is from Dr. John Beresford's 1963 Sandoz diary, where he says there, uh, he gave, gives doses of 50 whatevers from H0047. H0047 was the, the, um, the number, if you like, of that magic gram when it came to him. So clearly, Beresford retained some of that, and Hollingshead didn't take it all to Leary as he originally, originally thought. So he went to see Leary. Leary wasn't really interested at all. He thought Hollingshead was a bit of a chancer, a bit of a madman. But what Hollingshead did, <clears throat> he moved out of his own house, and he moved into a boarding house about half a mile from where Leary lived, and he wrote Leary a letter saying, basically, if you don't see me, I will commit suicide, which is a bit of a harsh way of getting an introduction. Leary, being the nice guy he was, and after taking advice from Ralph Metzner, said, OK, I'll meet with the guy. So they, they, they met again and had a, a long lunch. And during the period of a lunchtime, Hollingshead persuaded Leary to take him on as his, basically as his housekeeper and secretary. And Hollingshead moved into Leary's uh, house. So he was hanging out with Leary, Ralph Metzner was there, Barbara Ramdas, um, all, all, all those people. And then within about... With a couple of, in a couple of months, um, Leary was saying to, to Hollingshead, you must try my psilocybin pills, they're absolutely fantastic. Well, they were taking like two psilocybin pills each. Hollingshead's first dose was 20, and he said it was all right compared to acid. And Leary thought, well, this is a bit strange. Um, Hollingshead said, right, well, do you want to try some, some LSD, Tim? And Tim said, no, no, I, I'm, I'm sticking with my, um, uh, with my psilocybin, it's all I need. Anyway, one snowy night in, in, in the Christmas of um, 1962, I think it was, um, the jazz trumpeter Maynard Ferguson and his wife were staying at the Leary's house. Leary was a big jazz fan, a big friend of Maynard Ferguson. And uh, Hollingshead managed to persuade Maynard and Flo, his wife, to take a dose of acid. And within about half an hour of them taking it, uh, Flo Ferguson just said, this is fucking fantastic. Th this is just you can't believe what this is like, Tim, you have to take some. So Leary uh, said, OK, I'll have a spoonful. And that's where we get the, the term, the loving spoonful from, and the band's name and everything like that. And Leary had his mind completely blown that night. If you read anything that Leary wrote in High Priest or flashbacks about the trip, or you read Hollingshead's account of it, you will see that that just wiped Leary's mind clean. And he followed Hollingshead round like a, a duck following its mother round for about two or three weeks, to the point where Rolf Metzner and uh, Baba Ramdas were seriously concerned about Leary's um, state of mind. He was referring to Hollingshead as a guru, and he was completely, um, completely uh, tricked by, by him. Um, so they all got into, um, into acid. 
uh, then. And there was a, a, a couple of years in the, in the mid-60s, uh, between uh, 62 and 65, where Hollingshead and Leary fell out. Hollingshead ripped Leary off. He stole a load of money from him to go to a, a conference in, in France. Um, they, they fell out. Hollingshead and Wed went back to New York, and he started the Agora Foundation with John Beresford, which is a, a little-known um, psychedelic therapy unit that started in, in New York City. Um, Hollingshead came back to London. He was writing letters to Leary all the time, trying to become friends with him again. Leary was keeping him at a distance. And then in 1965, he heard that, um, that Leary had gone to, um, to Millbrook uh, in, in New York State, a, a huge house owned by um, the Hitchcock family, which had been virtually given on a peppercorn rent to, um, to Leary. And so Leary and his crew all decanted there and set up this psychedelic ashram, for want of a better word, where people were, uh, were, you know, were taking vast quantities of acid and all manner of strange people were coming there to trip because it was the place to go to. And Hollings had heard about that and thought, right, I'm going. He flew to America, he basically barged in to, um, to Millbrook and, and basically said, well, I'm here, you know, can I stay? And Leary, again, being a really nice guy, um, said, yes, of course you can. Um, if you YouTube Timothy Leary's wedding, there is a 10-minute film made by, I um, can't remember, famous film uh, director at that time, and you see Hollingshead for about a nanosecond as he flashes across the screen when they're dressing Tim up for his, um, for his uh, wedding. Um, so the, he got uh, encamped at, at Millbrook. Leary went on his honeymoon to, to Nepal. Uh, Hollingshead was sending him loads of acid to Nepal all the time. But when Leary was gone, um, the weirdness began. And a, a small crew of, um, of the people there, including um, Baba Ramdas, uh, decided to hole up in the bowling alley there and see just how high they could get. And so the, a few of them went there, and they were taking up to 4,000 micrograms a day of acid, not coming out, having food brought in, and just getting higher and higher and higher just to see what, what the limits of, of getting high were. And the limits of getting high were, of course, that after a while you don't get high anymore. Um, people like Paul Krasner um, came there to, to, to trip with Leary. Leary wasn't there, so um, Hollingshead tripped with him and completely freaked him out. And if you, again, if you read my book about it, you'll see that Hollingshead was, it was, it was displaying tricks to figure um, characteristics then and he would do things like the, the, they used to have these regular Saturday night um, sort of parties where they'd all sit around completely wasted on acid and conjure up scenarios about being in deep space and and you know what would they do if the spaceship failed and you know on sort of you know a thousand mics or more of acid that that is a real experience it's not an, it's not an abstract mental one and yet then somebody had noticed something outside the window and they'd open the curtains and Hollingshead would be bouncing up and down on a trampoline in green tights and a kilt with a mask on trying to freak them all out. Another one of his trips was because they used to get all these really, really serious um, East Coast um, intellectual seekers coming to sort of, you know, learn the, the, the meaning of life on, on acid. And Hollingshead's thing there was he'd wait till everyone was completely tripped out of their minds and he'd say, right, I'm going to take you and show you your true selves. And he'd get them all garbed up in, in robes and they'd get candles and things and he'd take them a labyrinthine tour around Millbrook and he'd take them down into the cellars and round corners and he'd be, he'd be telling them stories and really freaking them out. And then they'd come to at the end of a passageway and he'd say, right, this is it, this is your true self. And he'd let them in and they were facing a mirror which, if you think about it, is probably spot on. But, you know, it, it completely freaked people out because they were expecting something ultra-spiritual and they were just being shown themselves, which is basically all, all there was. Um, it was causing a lot of problems at Millbrook by doing this sort of thing. And so Leary and um, Metzner and Barbara Ramdas decided on a plan to, to basically get rid of him. It had always been Leary's idea to come over to Europe and Britain and try to replicate his guruhood here. You know, because he was a massive figure in America, but he wanted to be like, you know, the big man uh, in Britain. So they came up with this idea called Operation London, which was that um, Hollingshead would, would fly to London in September 65, and it would take with him a, quant a vast quantity of Czech acid, and he would set up the World Psychedelic Centre in London. So... Um, that's what he did. Um, but it, it, it wasn't quite as simple as that. Oops. Hollingshead's opinion was the psychedelic movement in England was small and badly formed. Well, that would have come as a shock to the people who were tripping in Britain at that time because they were quite happy. He also thought 
the spiritual content of the psychedelic experience has been overlooked. Again, I think if you speak to anyone who was around that time, like Joey Mellon or, 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 or in fact, Liz Elliott, who, who was in the audience, that, that they would contradict that, and they were quite happy doing their own thing on acid. But Hollingshead and Leary had this idea that the Britons were like mental pygmies when it came to psychedelics, and they needed you know, Mr. America to sort of sort them out. Um, and Leary had just written the Tibetan Book of the Dead, Psychedelic Book of the Dead, which is like the interpretation of the Tib Tibetan Book of the Dead, but from an acid point of view. And there they thought, well, that will give them a manual for running guided LSD sessions, because they had this idea that LSD sessions only really were effective if they were guided by sort of a guru or guide figure. Now, that again wasn't the view of people who were already tripping in Britain, and it's certainly never been my view, but it was like trying to impose the Leary view on the British mindset. There you go, that's, that's Leary and, uh, and Metzner. And when they were stood on the dock in New York waving Hollingshead off, Leary said, when Dick Alpert and I stood on the dock in New York waving goodbye, I said to Dick, well, that writes off the psychedelic revolution in England for at least 10 years. Because even though Leary wanted a foothold in Britain, he knew that Hollingshead would create um, uh, chaos, which is exactly what happened. Um, Now, um, this is Joey Mellon's quote, uh, and he said that when Hollingshead arrived and, and hooked up with Joey, that Hollingshead was very impressed by the happy scene he found there, with lots of young people on acid eating sugar, with no one putting over a big mystery scene. Uh, and the sugar aspect of it w w was new to Hollingshead, because, again, the, the sort of American way of, of taking acid was that you, you, know, you fasted for 12 hours before you took acid, because you needed it to be absolutely spiritually pure and all that bollocks. Well, in reality, if you fast for 12 hours before taking a heavy dose of psychedelic, you're probably going to be quite ill and jittery, and that can lead to a bad trip. And Joey Mellon and uh, Bart Hoogers from, from, um, from the continent had come up with this idea that bad trips were called by a thing called sugar lack, and that if you didn't have enough blood sugar in your system you took psychedelics, you were going to freak out, and that blood and the sugar could also calm you down if you were on acid, which, you know, is true. It will bring you down a little bit. So Hollingshead was introduced to this new way of, um, of, of taking acid. You see, his idea was um, always in a darkened room, smelling of incense with a commentary by the guru. That was the way the Americans had devised to keep people on sugar lax in control. It was a very rigid way of doing it, a very ritualized way of doing it, which, you know, um, certainly in my 47 years' experience of tripping, uh, it is not the British way. Oops. Another one there. Um, there you go, it's another quote from Joey Mellon. Uh, Leary was hard going, too falsified in some ways, whereas reading Huxley, there was a certain clarity to it. So, Hollingshead moved into a flat on uh, Pont Street, uh, 25 Pont Street, I think it was. It was funded by the millionaire Desmond O'Brien, who we saw earlier, and basically they set a flat up as um, a tripping den, and as you can see and there, this is supposedly a photograph from inside uh, Hollingshead flat, and you can see the light, there's a light show on all the time, uh, the, you know, they had soft... Um, carpets, mandalas on the wall, sound systems everywhere, but and some very, very serious LSD sessions were run there, but Hollingshead had a thing about, pardon me, dosing people, and you couldn't eat anything that was in there, you couldn't drink anything, you were unwise to, speak, to touch the door handles, and his next door neighbour told me that at one point they had an aerosol fitted so that when people opened the door, you got zapped with some, um, some um, atomised acid. And he was very keen on um, getting, uh, how shall I put it, uh, Dosing young ladies so they could fuck them. There's no two ways about putting That's what he used to do to people. A completely reprehensible way of doing things. And Amanda Fielding, uh, who I mentioned earlier, he dosed her with something like two or 3,000 micrograms of acid, and she was very, very ill for weeks afterwards. And it was all part of his plan to, uh, to seduce her. So he wasn't as nice um, as people um, thought. The... World Psychedelic Centre became, just became a party scene. There were people coming and going at all hours of na day and night. Uh, the police had been there undercover to see what had gone on. Hollingshead himself got bust in January 66 for, um, uh, for hash, but not at the flat. Um, and then on March 4th, um, adverts started to appear in um, 
for a, a fashionable London magazine called London Life, which was like the, the magazine of swinging London at the time. And they said that they were running this story called The Drug That Could Threaten London. And it was on the sides of buses, and it was on the television. And Hollingshead saw it and completely freaked out. He had no idea how this had come, apart, come about. London Life was, uh, was published, and you can see the, the cover there, shock report on the LSD drug, the man, say, the man who says Britain could be taken over with a brainwash powder. Um, and what happened was the uh, London Life people had got in touch with Desmond O'Brien, who fancied himself as a bit of a guru as well, and he told them the whole story about you know, how they used to dose people and how you could um, reduce London to a gibbering wreck by putting acid in the water supply, which is untrue scientifically, but it made big news at the time. And this created a massive furore. Um, the World Psychedelic Centre flat work was bust um, in early March that year, and five people, including Hollingshead, were all um, arrested and charged for, um, for cannabis. They didn't find any acid because, A, at that time it was still legal, and B, the police didn't know what to look for. So, you know, little bottles of clear liquid wouldn't really have been particularly uh, appealing to them. Um, what we got next? And this is a comment from uh, Joey Mellon about Hollingshead's modus operandi. He was sex mad and he didn't get enough because he was off-putting to girls, sort of driven and mad. I think he used his drugs to get sex. He did have an evil side, I'm afraid. In a way, it was as though he couldn't help himself. I don't think he was really evil like some people are. He just wanted to get what he wanted and would use his drugs to get it. I think he really didn't understand love. Now, when you take that sort of behaviour into, in, in, into account and relate it to his upbringing and whatever it was that he got sent away to the psychotherapeutic school for, you can see that basically at some point there'd been a complete disconnect between him and his parents. He, he did not, couldn't give love and couldn't accept it. And um, this theory runs through the book and it is explained at the end. And I was wary about doing it because you know, I'm not a psychologist and I certainly don't agree with COD psychology, but I ran the text of the book by, by Ben Sessor who agreed totally that that was exactly what was going on. Um, that, that's his charge sheet there. You can see Michael John Shinkfield called himself an artist. Um, and he was 34, which for being on the scene in 1966 was, was quite old, which gave him another edge in the manipulation stakes. Um, so he went to court, he was bailed, and then he jumped bail uh, at least three times in the spring of... Um, of 1966, and during that time, he basically went mad. He, it, by that time, he was a method, methadrine addict and a heroin addict. And in those days, I, I, I've been told by, by many trippers that they used to use methadrine with acid, because at the time, that, the acid was so strong that, that you could get sort of lost in it, whereas you added some methadrine to it, and it gave you a bit of motive power to drive you through. So he got strung out on methadrine because of that, and then he was using heroin to come down from the, from the, you know, the intense methadrine and, and LSD trips. So he jumped bail, and he went to nor the north of England. He went to visit some... Um, uh, some relatives, uh, he went all over the place, he went to Sweden, and there's an apocryphal tale, which I've been told by two separate unrelated people, so I tend to think it's right, that Interpol, sorry, not Interpol, uh, the British police sent two policemen out to Sweden to arrest him, um, and he handed himself in, and then coming back on the plane, he'd managed to secrete some acid, he put acid in their coffee, and when, they, when the plane landed at Heathrow, Hollingshead just waltzed off through customs and, and disappeared again, handing himself in um, a few days later. Um, he was sent to Wormwood Scrubs first um, as a holding uh, prison for a while, and whilst in, a, in Wormwood Scrubs, he was visited by um, Owsley, the famous American uh, acid chemist, and Barbara Damras, Ramdas, and they brought him some acid in, in grapes, and he was turning selected prisoners on, one of whom it was um, the Russian spy, George Blake, who'd not long been arrested and sent to prison and was doing time in Wormwood Scrubs. And in his autobiography, um, Hollingshead goes into great detail about the trip he had with, with George Blake. Unfortunately, we only have Hollingshead's um, account of that, so it may not be true, but it's a very good story. It was then transferred in October 66 to HMP Layhill in Gloucestershire, where basically he took over the prison. He was writing letters for prisoners, he was writing a pantomime, he was involved in, they had a gliding society there, believe it or not, how you have a gliding society in a prison, I have no fucking idea, but he did. Um, it was just integral to it, and in one of his many letters, he was a prolific letter writer, in one of his many letters to Leary, 
Uh, it drew this cartoon of, of him facing a prison, prison warder saying, six months in prison, never late, never sick, never on report, and works harder than anyone else. What's your little game, eh? 596 Shingsfield, Holling, Holling Z. Well, his little game was obvious. He, he wanted to be the kingpin in, in the prison. Anyway, he served his time in prison with, 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 um, with no, uh, no problems. He came out in uh, October 67, so basically he'd missed the whole... 66, 67 summers of love. He was down on his luck, he had no money. Uh, Leary had sent him a little bit of money, so he decided to go to, um, he went on a bit of a tour for a few years. Um, oh, I don't know that comes next. What does that say? Yeah, he initially he moved to Norway and Sweden, where uh, in Sweden he got hooked up with a millionaire called Simon Spies, who was one of the first people to, to, um, to run cheap airlines to, to the Mediterranean. Uh, Simon Spies, if you Google him, was a very strange character. He liked his drugs. Um, Hollingshead was very keen to help him like his drugs. And then in January 68, Simon Spies and a few of his millionaire friends said to Hollingshead, if we give you a lot of money, many thousands of pounds, which is a lot in those days, will you go to London and score as vast amounts of acid? Holling said, yes, of course I will. And they never saw him again. He just took the money and he vanished. Uh, so from there, he went to California to see Leary, and him and Leary lived with the Brotherhood of Eternal Love for several months on their, um, their, uh, their ranch there. Uh, and in his um, autobiography, he said that he thinks he might have been taking too much acid. Well, for Hollingshead to say that just shows exactly what was going on. So after a while, he wanted a bit of peace and quiet. Um, so he took a mysterious trip to the Pacific island of Tonga. Now, Tonga is in the middle of nowhere now, very hard to get to even now. In 68, it, it, it took two or three days to get there. Nobody knows why he went there. It's possibly was scoping out um, a site, another site for another brotherhood commune. But he went there anyway and um, took a load of acid with him, as you do. He met up with some of the American Peace Corps there, turned all them on there. One of them completely freaked out and thought it was Jesus. And all of a sudden, Hollingshead had to leave. So he left Tonga. He went um, back to the States and he got hooked up with an experimental filmmaker called Scott Bartlett. Again, if you Google him or if you read my book, you'll see Scott Bartlett was right at the forefront of experimental filmmaking. And um, Hollings had helped him with a film called Moon 69, which um, is on online. And it's a very, very, very uh, experimental film with lots of um, phased and, and shifted images of the moon with Hollingshead and a few other people talking over the top of it. Hollingshead was paid uh, at least $1,000, possibly more for that. Again, a lot of money in those days. And he decided that uh, the best thing to do, because everybody was doing it at that time, was to um, go to Nepal. So he landed in Nepal on the, um, the day the Americans uh, landed on the moon, I think it was and he immediately got involved in, in, uh, in society in Kathmandu because he took loads of acid with him and effectively Californian um, sunshine acid was extremely good currency. He got to meet everyone he wanted to do. Um, he, he tripped with various members of the Nepalese royal family because he'd gone to school with one of them. Um, and um, he decided while he was there that he was going to start the, the world's first um, psychedelic poetry magazine. Um, what's that done? Oh, there you go. It's uh, called Flow, which if you, if you check it out online, you probably have to pay about a £1,000 a copy these days. It, it's so rare. And that was a mixture of um, poetry written by Westerners over, over, over there, some of the psychedelically turned on Nepalese and various, various articles. And it was there he met a guy called Christoph Glinker, who, who features in the Hollingshead story a lot. Uh, and Christoph um, hooked up with him and helped him um, uh, run Flow. And then he decided to come back to Britain in 1970. Came back to Britain and, um, oh, hang on. I'll show you that. that that's uh, that's Hollingshead at a music festival in, in Nepal, up there on the, sitting sideways on, on the, um, on the top, um, top wall. Flew back to Britain, went to see his sister in Scotland uh, near um, Rosalind Chapel, um, and hooked up with some monks who lived there called the Fraternity of the Transfiguration, who were quite sort of extreme liberal monks. And they had a base on the island of, um, I forgot, Mil uh, Millport, um, just off uh, Glasgow. That's not the island, that's the name of the, um, of the town. Um, but they moved to this, this, uh, this 
cathedral there and basically set up a hippie commune in the grounds. Now, the original idea was that the hippies were going to help the monks grow um, corn and wheat and keep animals and so on and so forth. But within two or three months, um, the quantities of acid there had just overwhelmed everyone. And basically, they were just taking drugs and having full moon ceremonies where they were um, uh, banging on drums and, and shouting at the moon and things. And they tripped out a couple of the monks and... Um, unsurprisingly, were asked to leave. Um, but it's, it's, a very, it's a long story, which is in the book. Um, it even made um, a Daily Mail, where a drug man goes into a monastery, uh, where he, he you know, was interviewed and said that it was going to start this, um, this monastery to try and deprogram people. Um, that's the Cathedral of the Isles, where, where they had it in the grounds. And they were running all these sort of weird things. This was like the initiation ceremony to their... Um, their little um, commune, which was the Free High Church. Um, and it says what happened there. They loaded a chillum up, chillum is lit, and then they chanted the names of the drugs, and then that person was sort of initiated into their, um, into their cult. And that is, the, that is the certificate that people were given, basically, which was printed on rice paper and uh, is on the point of, uh, of disintegration. Um, so, but after a while, the, the, the church authorities thought, well, we don't want dirty hippies in our cathedral, so we're going to get rid of them. So there was a lot of stuff in the press about um, how they were um, got rid of, uh, basically. Um, it got to the point where they were confrontational and decided that they were going to stay, and you can see, we stay, Isle Hippies. Uh, and I have a fantastic um, transcript of a tape that was made at the time when the, they've got the... Um, the the high sheriff there, the dean of the aisles, and someone else, and they're all arguing about, about who can stay and who can't do it. It's fascinating. But eventually they went. Um, Hollings had connections with a guy called Steve Abrams, who I'm sure many of you will have heard of from psychedelic history. And at the time, Abrams was living um, at a place called Hilton Hall, which is a very old building which had been used by, I think, pre-Raphaelites at some time. Um, Abrams was living there with uh, Tom Keyes, who uh, was a, a poet and a writer, he used to write scripts for Blake Seven and things like that. And they were heavily into acid. And it was just about the time when they were getting hooked up with um, a guy called Ron Stark, who was um, front-loading acid labs uh, financially to get them to be, um, uh, produce lots of, um, of acid. So what happened there, they, they turned up at, um, at Hilton Hall one evening, about 15 uh, scruffy hippies, and uh, Steve Abrams said, oh, we've got this, uh, this new substance we'd like you to try. Um, and it was some form of acid, they don't know what, and something else which Abrams descri described as a propellant. Never worked out what it was, possibly DMT. But they all took it, and even though all Hollingshead and his team were extremely experienced trippers, it completely freaked them out. And in the, um, the Book of Cumbria, which is the island that we're on, uh, which they wrote, this was um, their um, account of it. It's an incarnation at Steve's in Hilton Hall, and then it says, um, it's crystalline, you're going to have fun. We say church, he say hi. Two hours later, time to die. And basically, it just freaked him out to the point where some of them were taking the clothes off and climbing trees, televisions were smashed, it, it, they thought they were going to have to call the police, and it, it took them a long time to calm them down. So it was some, uh, some heavy shit, basically. But from there, they, 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 they trotted off the next day, oh, no, we'll leave that for a minute, trotted off the next day uh, and went to um, a place in Archway, which was owned by one of the communards' wives, and they moved in there. And they planned... Um, it was Christoph and Hollingshead's idea. They'd been into the, the I Ching for years. It was like, you know, the, the default hippie go-to um, divination system. And um, they decided they wanted to do an install, what we would call nowadays an installation based on the I Ching. So they came up with this fantastic idea, um, which would... Um, I don't know what that shows. Um, oh, that's when, that's when they first thought of it, 16th of October. And what they did was... They hired the Richard DeMarco Gallery in Edinburgh, which is a very famous art gallery, still there today. They booked it for a few weeks in early 72, and they, they decked out this whole house um, so that the person came in at the front door, they asked the receptionist a question, which they wanted answered by the I Ching. There was a randomised um, 
computer system which sent messages to a computer terminal in Newcastle which came back with the, um, the trigram and then they took that trigram upstairs, uh, went through various rooms that were all mirrors and lights and music and eventually ended up in, in front of a, um, a guru figure who would give that person their, um, you know, their, their interpretation of, of the I Ching. Now, if that was done these days, it would still be innovative and it would be on the news. If it had been done in London or New York at the time, it would have been everywhere. It would have been in all the history books. But because it was in Edinburgh, it was ignored. But it was a massive success. It ran for um, two or three weeks and people went to it. And, you know, there were girls running out of it saying, this is fantastic, this is the best experience of my life. So even though it could be a bit of a twat, basically, every now and again he came up with some fan fantastic ideas. Um, and in fact, the, the, we have at least one person in the audience who went to Changes 72, Liz Elliott over there, who would no doubt tell you what it was like. Um, so it was quite a thing. Um, that's the official program, and you'll note that they called it an exhibition because they didn't want to call it an exhibition, and the word installation hadn't come into um, common currency at that, that time, and that just tells you basically what happens. You went space room, and then into a maze, and so on and so forth. After that, it was on the move again, and he decided to write his autobiography. He'd managed to get an advance of, um, I think it was about 1,500 quid from uh, Blondon Briggs to write his autobiography. So what he did was, Christoph, who'd been with him in Nepal and in London, did all the research and, and the writing of the book. Hollingshead just did little bits of it. And for, for the summer, well, for 72 and most of 73, it, he was writing his biography. Um, oh, we've done that bit, haven't we? Went to several Franciscan monasteries to, to get a bit of peace and quiet, to collect his thoughts and make notes. And he, he took an interest in um, from the Franciscan aspect of religion during that time. Uh, what we've got there, Rip, ripped off his researcher. What he did was, um, he got the manuscript finished, Christoph had finished it all, and it was ready to go to the, to the publishers. And one morning, um, Hollingshead came back to the archway flat, went upstairs to see Christoph, um, said, I'm packing, I'm, I'm going to America. And Christoph said, well, well, why? He said, well, because the book's coming out and I've got me the rest of my advance. And Christoph said, but weren't you supposed to be paying me? He said, well, uh, perhaps later. And he just left him and fucked off to America. And, and as Christoph said, Christoph was pissed off. <laughs> uh, he then went to America, and his, his daughter Vanessa, who was about, oh, about 11 at that time, was living in a commune in, in Dawes Hill in upstate New York. So he went to live there, and he was giving his daughter mescaline, and he was, he was telling the other hippies he was going to shoot them. He was completely off the rails on, on, on a variety of drugs by that time, um, uh, going quite mad. Um, he hooked up with, oh yes, he had his own theme song recorded. At that time in America, wherever he went, he used to carry a cassette player with him, and at the drop of a hat, he would press it, and this song called The Man Who Turned On The World would come out of it. Now, I haven't got it here today, unfortunately. You can Google it. Uh, but what happened there was, when he was in prison, he, he met up with um, a record pr producer, and this record producer was involved in, in, in writing various songs, and he wrote a song about Hollingshead called The Man Who Turned On The World, which subsequently was released in a, a, an album of Christian devotional songs where it was implied it was about Jesus, which made everybody laugh. Uh, what else have we got there? Uh, yeah, yeah. His autobiography came out in, in the UK and the USA to mixed reviews, and he, he really then started his long and final descent into alcoholism and drug addiction. Um, that is, in fact, the, the, the single, The Man Who Turned On The World. Uh, Patrick Ryan was the, um, the guy he was in prison with. I've never tracked him down, just seems to have vanished off the face of the earth. Um, and it was a single which um, got somewhere in the charts in Luxembourg, big in Luxembourg, and it was also in an album called, um, whatever that's called, beyond something or other, which had people like Clifford T. Ward on and various members of Genesis. Um, yeah, that, that's it on the back there. There's some, some more details about it there. Um, where did it say it? See, the Friends of St. Francis con conceal a strange number of experiences and people. Somehow they all come together in one of the strongest tracks on the album, blah, blah, blah. But th what they didn't realise was it was about Hollingshead and, and his drugs. Um, yeah, it's, um, he came back to Britain, uh, wrote a play with Mim Scala, who again some of you might have heard of, uh, about his time in Nepal, which never got, uh, never got published. 
And then in the mid to late 70s, he returned to Nepal to lead trekking tours and to do some lectures and to start the Himal Centre, which was um, a sort of a cultural uh, east-west centre. Came back to Britain in the late 70s, and uh, I don't know if some of you have heard of it, but there was a, a very, very good drug magazine founded by Lee Harris in the late 70s called Homegrown, and Hollingshead was in on the planning stages and was instrumental in, in getting it published and wrote for the first, um, the first issue. He then married um, a, a British socialite called Ev Hesketh, and uh, they went back to America, and they were living in, um, in Laurel Canyon with Tom Keyes and um, other people. There. Yes, he started to write interviews for artic and articles for Homegrown, and he wrote for um, High Times, and he wrote for Omni, and, and various other people. Um, he also, in California, started this thing called the, um, the University of Hollywood, which... Um, it was supposed to be a sort of a hippie cultural abstract university that, that, that was going to be done through television shows and things. But again, basically, it was just a cover for a, for a huge drug-taking extravaganza. And if you read the account of the party uh, that they had to open it in, in my book, you, you'll see how, um, how bonkers it all was. And then he started to rip people off. He ripped Omni magazine off by taking money for articles that he hadn't written. He got heavily involved with Marvel Comics and um, punted a sort of a suggestion to them that he would come up with the text of um, this uh, comic series about um, advances in science and things like that. Marvel put tens of thousands of dollars into, into doing it. They got him an illustrator and everything. And basically, Hollingshead just didn't stump up with the, um, with the required words. And he was exposed, and that was the end of his time in... Um, in New York, he'd run out of money, he was heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol, um, he'd met another, yet another woman who was also a drinker and a heroin addict and they, for some reason, managed to hit it off, and he just decided that he had to get out. So, he knew, in New York, he knew a drug sm a cocaine smuggler called Michael Froelich. Michael Froelich had a huge operation down in Bolivia, uh, which may or may not have involved smuggling cocaine, I'm not entirely sure. So, Holling said moved to Bolivia in 1984, and this is him standing outside Froelich's house. Um, essentially, it was hired as a childminder for Michael Froelich, um, and in his letters to Leary, he was telling him that he was getting clean, that he was, uh, he was helping with founding a jojoba plantation, because jojoba had just become quite popular in cosmetics. Um, and yet, when I did a Skype interview with Michael Froelich, um, at the end of last year, he just laughed his head off and he said Hollingshead wasn't capable of working, let alone starting a hoba plantation. And he was getting more and more involved in, um, in drug use. And obviously in Bolivia, you've got quite easy access to the highest quality cocaine possible at virtually no money. And he was completely wasted all the time, drinking heavily on top. Um, he developed a, um, a stomach ulcer. Um, and if you read the sort of traditional histories, uh, it, it, there are many speculations about why and how Hollingshead died. Well, I, I managed to track it down to exactly what happened. Um, it was due to go into hospital for a, um, a stomach operation on his ulcer. And he went in, and um, he didn't like being in hospital, waiting for the operation. His girlfriend uh, from New York flew down to see him, and he persuaded her to bring him a bottle of vodka in. And he drank the bottle of vodka, his ulcer burst, and he died in hideous pain in, in, hos in the hospital. His last letter to, to, to Tim Leary was, uh, the, the end bit was, here, like big condors, we have room to fly, um, which is quite ironic because he died about two days later and no flying was involved. Um, his death certificate, um, it never registered in Britain, dead, it's only a Bolivian uh, death certificate, and you can see there that they've put, it's a hemorrhage of his, um, of his whatever it is. Um, and because he had no money, and his parents in Britain had no money, they couldn't afford to fly him back to bury him, so uh, he was sort of thrown at the mercy of the um, authorities there, and they managed to persuade the German cemetery to, um, to bury him there. So that's his original grave in the German cemetery, and they put him there because it was a walled and guarded cemetery, and um, if he'd have been buried in any of the, the communal cemeteries there, his body would have been dug up, dug up and they stripped him of his clothes, his jewellery, and whatever else he'd been buried with. Um, it was later exhumed, 
Um, and you can see somewhere on there his name, Holling Z. Michael, and the date of his death. And they even managed to spell Holling Z wrong, which is, uh, is quite funny. I think that's a, a close up of it. Um, and basically, I know I've done that in, in, I mean, that talk could have been four times as long. I've just skimmed and I've just missed lots out. But fascinating character is the underside of, of the psychedelic experience. You know, whereas most people talk about, you know, how lovely it was, all love and peace and everything was groovy. His life was difficult. It was horrible to people a lot of the time. And everything he did that was good was balanced out by something that was bad. You know, one of his, his um, ex-partners ended up in a, a mental asylum. Uh, others never wanted to speak to him again. Uh, but he's a fascinating character, and it just gives another angle on that whole scene. Uh, and, and that's that. Thank you.